Hi, I'm Dr. Raj, and here's a sample case from Medicine Morning Report Beyond the Pearls. We have a 57-year-old female who comes to the ED with three months of progressive cough, shortness of breath, and subjective fevers. Let's stop right there. When someone has these complaints, common things are common. Could it be infectious? Definitely, but what jumps out at me is a little bit odd three months. Most people are not going to have an infection for three months, so it's time to think outside the box. Is there something else that's non-infectious going on here? Let's go back to the history. She denies any hemoptysis or rashes and has not traveled recently. Stop right there. Is it important to know travel history and geography when talking about infections? The answer is yes, especially when we're talking about fungal infections. So she lives in Arizona and works as a school teacher. Her past medical history is only significant for hypertension and she is on our favorite calcium channel blocker known as amylodipine on physical examination. Her blood pressure is normal. Her heart rate is normal. Wait, look at that respiratory rate. It's 28. Uh oh, red flag. Why is she so tachypnic? Is it something going on in the lungs? Now I look at the next vital sign. Her oxygen saturation is 86% on room air. Is that a warning sign? Uh, definitely, we need to come to the conclusion of what's going on here. So on physical exam, there's diffuse ronk I heard on lung examination, but the remainder of the exam is normal. Chest x-ray and CT scan of the chest was appropriately ordered and what's this? Large cavitary lesions. We got to take a look at this. So here is the chest x-ray and what do you see? I see bilateral nodular and mass like densities and there is a huge one around the left lung. So a CT scan of the chest was ordered and wow, this is impressive. Now you can appreciate those bilateral cavitary lesions. Can anyone solve the puzzle? I think we need some more labs. What do you think? What is our differential diagnosis for this cavitary lesion? Like I said, Let's think about infection. Bacteria such as Staph aureus, definitely MRSA. What about uh, mycobacterium? What about tuberculosis and some of the other types of mycobacterium like MAI? And we already mentioned fungal infections, so which funguses can do this? What about coccidioides emetus? What about cryptococcus? What about histoplasmosis? The answer is yes, yes, yes. But now we said because of the three months, let's think outside the box. What can give you cavitary lesions? Cancer. And when we talk about lung cancer, what's the classic lung cancer that gives you cavitary lesions? Squamous cell carcinoma. And how about a infarction from a PE that gets a secondary infection? That can look like a cavity, but small vessel vasculitis has to be somewhere in a differential diagnosis. And last but not least, I have to mention sarcoid. Sarcoid can do anything in the lung. Back to our patient, let's get some labs. What jumps out at Dr. Raj is the WBC count is 18,000. Doesn't really help me though. Why? Because this could be infectious, but many of these inflammatory diseases can give you a leukocytosis. The creatinine is normal at 1.1. So I know there's no kidney involvement, but wait a minute, here comes some important antibodies. The p anchor was negative, but the c anchor was positive. And more importantly, the antiproteinase 3 was also positive, which leads me to my first basic science step one pearl. Remember the pitfalls of relying on immunofluorescence. When we talk about c anchor and p anchor, it's only going to be a pattern. What you really need to know is the antigen specific enzyme linked aminosorbent assay. That was a mouthful. But what it means is what is that specific antibody? And if it's C anchor positive, is the P anti PR3 positive? That's going to be the most important. And remember, these ANCAs do not correlate reliably with disease flare. Oh, look at this picture. What is happening to my patient? She is developing hemoptysis. She's coughing up blood. And this needs to be evaluated, especially because what's in our differential? Small vessel vasculitis. That's very high in the differential now. So what are we worried about? Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Time for a step two, step three pearl. How do we work up diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? Well, the answer is we need to perform a bronchoscopy, which is going to be a scope that we place through the trachea, we go into the lungs, and we wedge the tip of that scope into one of the bronchi where we suspect the alveolar hemorrhage, and we throw a little salt water in there and pull it back up. It's known as a lavage. And look at this picture. There's bloody return. 
that got subsequently more and more bloody. That is how you diagnose alveolar hemorrhage. That is a step two, three pearl. So let's go back to our patient. What is the final diagnosis with the history and physical, with the imaging and the labs? Number one of my differential is gonna be granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Many of you know that formally as Wegner's granulomatosis. So what are some beyond the pearls for everyone? Number one, remember that most GPA relapses occur within the first year. And when you relapse, it may not be the same organ system every time. Number two, when you give cyclophosphamide, there is a nasty metabolite known as acrolin. And this can cause horrible things such as hemorrhagic cystitis and bladder cancer. So what do we do? We give a little mesna anytime we give cyclophosphamide to prevent this. And last but not least, remember you need to have a high index of suspicion for diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, especially in these small vessel vasculitides, because patients do not necessarily need to have the hemoptysis to have this problem. I'm Dr. Raj. That was one of my cases from Medicine Morning Report beyond the pearls.